building a uh, uh, program to submit to our decadal uh, survey uh, committee for their effort that will begin next year to, to build a decadal survey for fundamental physics and for biological and physical sciences at NASA. A group that's been really uh, seminal in, in steering this program for the last couple of years is the Standing Review Board for Fundamental Physics. Uh, current chair is Brian DeMarco. He's on right now and I, I'd like to have him uh, come in for a couple of minutes to just talk about the opportunity that he and the, the Standing Review Board sees for as a prospect for quantum science and, and plasma, just the plasma physics in uh, in space. Brian? Sure, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Yeah, so I, I just have some um, sort of general prepared remarks and thoughts to share with everyone here. And I, I want to welcome you also to this event. And I'm excited to hear about recent progress in the program and also to hear about your visions and dreams for the future. So what I'd say is, as a field, fundamental uh, physics and space and microgravity is ripe with opportunity, and it follows from this amazing legacy, going back to the superfluid helium lambda point measurement, which flew on Columbia in 1992. And here we are, fast forward almost 30 years later, and now we have some of the coldest quantum matter in the universe that we know about in sustained microgravity on the ISS. So the Cold Atom Lab, or CAL, is a triumph of engineering and science, and a really important first step to a much broader program, which is what we're here to talk about today. To really look forward, as Brad said, to the, to the next decade and, and even farther. Um, so I just wanted to share, and Brad asked me to share my perspective and the board's perspective on this program and where it may lead and, and future opportunities. So I think we're all excited about the follow-on mission to CAL, which is BCAL, which is the second generation ultra-cold gas experiment with expanded capabilities for atom interferometry new geometries, and exploring, for example, the spin degree of freedom of atoms. So this kind of physics is, is important. You know, many particle quantum systems are a frontier of 21st century physics that cuts across all scales of the universe, from neutron stars to BECs flying up in the ISS right now, to the quark gluon soup inside a nucleon. This is a real frontier, and we're, we should be excited and bold about exploring it. So looking out even farther, I think things we'll hear about today which really should set the stage for this decadal report, are exciting ideas about things like lattice clocks flying in space that can lead to new kinds of precision measurement, quantum optics and networks in space as well, and other things that, that we'll hear about. I'm just gonna pick out a couple examples. So flying a lattice clock would provide a new quantum sensor, sensor in space sensitive to a wide range of effects. And I think we'll hear from this group that's been thinking about this. This is an exciting chance to establish a facility for sensing gravity and precision measurement that could make a foundation for measurements of the equivalence principle, new searches for dark matter, and many other areas. We'll also hear about the Deep Space Quantum Link STD. And you know, here there's chances to dream big about an Earth ISS or satellite lunar gateway quantum network where there's the opportunity to study quantum entanglement and new gravitational regimes and new space-time geometry. And this could really be the basis for a network of quantum sensors like clocks. You need those quantum links um, to connect things together and enable even measurements over broader baselines. And these two programs as an example or potential programs that uh, SDDs have been working very hard on have a really exciting resonance with the National Quantum Initiative and emerging programs in quantum information and science across the whole world. You know, there's a close coupling in this domain between fundamental physics, like we'll hear about today, and science and technology development. And there are even key techniques that could be sort of um, fueled by this program, such as ground space quantum links and precision, precision frequency standards. These are needs to move the technology forward and applications forward. And there's a really, I think many of us have seen this constant feedback between fundamental physics, new discoveries, and new technology development. So I think we can dream big here. I mean, we can even imagine this is not going to be the, the next decade or even a decade after that. But what about a future where we have a network, a quantum network of clocks and atom parameters throughout the solar system? Think about this sort of new era of multi-messenger astronomy that could enable exploration, physics, and cosmology. And this is the beginning stages of that. 
So what a dream like that takes is, is these first steps that we're here to discuss today, and then a plan and a commitment to a sustained ground-based research effort that feeds future missions, and a strategic tech development plan and a series of missions coupling together technology development and science that drives the field forward. So it's, it's not my area, but I'm always excited to hear about the Dusty Plasma projects, which are part of this program, which also have a, a splinter session today. You know, like PK4, these are a central part of the program, and there's exciting physics questions which connect to my own interests and in quantum about identifying organizing principles of matter at the mesoscale. So in future, I think the physics um, is wide open in, in microgravity and space. There's new regimes of gravity, velocity, and distance that can lead us forward to new physics. And now it's really up to all of us to propose bold new programs to feed these ideas into the Decadal Report and to align all these opportunities and advance the field. So thanks, that's all I wanted to say. Thanks, Brian. Uh, appreciate your remarks there. And uh, if I can get my charts up, Okay, uh, next chart, please. This is a real simple agenda. I'm going to keep this simple so we can um, work through this. Everybody understands what we're trying to do, and then uh, we'll, in the second hour of this meeting, move to our similar sessions where we'll really start focusing on uh, building consensus around some ideas that we can uh, think about taking forward to our decadal planning. First, I'd like to go over just uh, why we're here and what it, you know, we're focusing on building a good decadal product for fundamental physics. I'm going to talk about why that's important and then wind up with a lead into Ulf Israelson's pitch on um, the areas that we'll be talking about in the splinter sessions. Decadal is really an essential thing for, for all the, the elements of, of a, a NASA program of a science program because the the management structure of, of uh, NASA science really leans on decadals as the as the plan and the roadmap for investment in the future. So if, in order to they use it well they use a decadal to to build their sense of priorities and where to make investments. So that includes investments within fundamental physics. Now, what areas of fundamental physics are uh, going to be a priorities for investments going to be determined by the decadal and how much investment NASA uh, science actually makes in fundamental physics as well as going to be determined by the the priorities that that the decadal survey gives fundamental physics and the, the research areas in fundamental physics. So it's essential for the community in fundamental physics to, to take an active part in, in building it, the story that we take the decadal committee to, in order to first determine the priorities for fundamental physics for, for NASA's science mission directorate to, to uh, establish investment priorities for fundamental physics, and then to dis determine the the priority that fundamental physics gets within the biological and physical sciences. The decadal committee has uh, not yet been established. The, the, the task has just in the in the last month been accepted by the academies and NASA. And the effort to build the, the committee to identify um, the committee members is is just underway now. What our real product is and what the, the form of the, the, the community's input to the decadal is really essential is, um, is the white paper. The white paper is really the, 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 the currency of communication between the community and the decadal committee. The, the number of white papers that are submitted by other um, fields of science for decadal, for decadal uh, surveys in, say, astrophysics or planetary is in the many hundreds, you know, uh, between 700 and 1,000 white papers submitted 
or uh, planetary science or uh, astrophysics. Now, those are much larger programs than us, but it, the measure, it's a sense of the scale of the, the input that is the standard for uh, decadal surveys and other fields. As we look forward to the decade, our own decadal, we're going to have a couple of results coming in that may have an impact on um, our decadals in the fundamental physics. We've got ESA's Voyage 2050 report that's going to be coming out in mid-21. And the, the NASA Astrophysics Decadal Survey, Astro 2020, is expected to be released about that time as well. We have another set of really important decadals that, that are going to be uh, a source of input to the biological and physical sciences decadal. We, we already have the um, AMO, Atomic Molecular and Optical Physics, a 2019 decadal survey, and the Plasma 2020 decadal that uh, was released earlier this year and, and have, have good endorsements for, for microgravity research in quantum science and in uh, plasma physics. So it's important for us to, to keep some of that momentum from those decadals and carry that into the biological and physical, physical sciences decadal. In early through mid-21, we expect to be, um, we need to be producing white papers for, for our decadal because that's the basic input that's, that's going to be the, the measure of the community's enthusiasm and, and, and support for, for the research themes and the mission concepts that we're ho hoping to submit to our decadal. From mid-21 through mid-22, the panels of, of the decadal committee will be reviewing those white papers so, so that committee, the, the committee for the decadal actually does take each of those white papers and review them and, and uh, build their, their draft findings and recommendations from those white papers. So the white papers are essential input for them. Once the panels complete their draft findings, there's a long process of what I'm going to call peristalsis here, where the result goes through the, the GI tract of the academy. And it, it takes quite a while because it has to be uh, ultimately released as a report of the National Academies, not just of the, the, the Cato Committee. So there's a long cycle of review that's involved before we expect this uh, report to be released in, um, we hope, mid-23. And again, I need to... Uh, emphasize that that's just my personal estimate. They think um, the decadal report might come out as early as you know January, February 23, where we hope to to get it released in time to to uh, form a basis for the uh, NASA's 2025 budget request. And in order to achieve that, we need to get this decadal report out fairly early in 23. Next chart, please. So the next steps again, we we need to assemble the committee, and that, so if, if by some chance some you're called by a, the academies and you're asked to be on a committee, please uh, try very hard to to accept that request because we really need to have informed and experts in our areas of quantum science and dusty plasmas to be on the committee so that they can effectively read and understand the white papers and then communicate the value of the, the research to the other members of the committee. We also need to have a, a strong showing of, of, of well-detailed white papers. And the white papers, um, the authorship is is often uh, multiple. There are often many authors of white papers, and international participation in white paper development is is strongly encouraged. We expect to hold mission concept workshops to to 
make sure that that we have a clear sense of what our research themes are are focused on and what our mission concept science goals are and that our community understands that so that they can um make their own judgments and and, and um help us refine those concepts and add their own measures and ideas to those concepts and make them stronger and, and put the best case we can to the decadal committees. There will also be, I anticipate, decadal panel meetings that, that may have open events for community participation. And if, if that does happen, please make your strongest effort to participate in that. And then the committee basically takes all that and and writes the report that uh, is a largely internal process. Next chart, please. Oh, yes. After we get the decadal report, <clears throat> there's a, a sort of mysterious effort that, that goes into producing the, the decadal profit plan phase three. Now, this is an old South Park joke uh, where the underpants gnomes have phase one where they steal a, the town's underwear and then phase three where they profit from it. But the the path through phase two is is um, a mystery to everyone. <laughs> the, the, the path from getting the report to getting the profit, that you know the, the boost in the budget and support for the decadal is uh, a complicated one. But NASA's science mission directorate has a long history of using the decadal reports as basically the foundation for uh, program growth. It's well recognized by the Office of Management, Management and Budget and policy people in Washington that the decadal, decadal reports have, have a lot of stature and credibility and the path the path from the, the report to the profit phase is, while it's not, it's not a, a simple one, it begins with strong support from the science community as evidenced in the decadal. Next chart, please. I want to make sure that everybody understands what a white paper is, because it is a basis for, for uh, the communicating our, our themes and mission concepts to the, the decadal committee. They're basically just a, a short uh, paper that, in the words of the, the call for white papers from the Astro 2020 decadal, specifically and succinctly identifies new science opportunities and compelling science themes. That's, that's pretty simple. You're just telling to a group of your fellow scientists, what you want to do and and why it's important. These white papers are listed and reviewed by the committee, and they they advertise for this for the white papers and and specify a format. Five to seven pages is the range that I've seen in other uh, white paper solicitations. It's a big source of community input. International participation is encouraged. White paper authorship is shared, and typically the development of white papers is coordinated through a hub. So that's a website where people can post what they expect to be writing a white paper on, and so there's not a lot of overlap, and people can can join groups that 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 are preparing or are writing white papers. We don't have our hub set up yet, but that will be coming in the next couple of months. Thanks. Next chart, please. The next steps for today, really simple. We're going to have a, a number of splinter sessions following this thing. It's a, you should look for the splinter session that most closely matches with your interests. Join that splinter session. Listen to what the, the the chair and panelists talk about is research objectives for NASA and those NASA and our partners in in the relevant fields, and then look for opportunities to write white papers. Look and look for co-authors. 
I know this is just a beginning, but it's uh, it's an important start. This is our start, the start of our effort to organize the community that we have. A small community, but it's it's going to grow, I'm sure, and we will have future topical workshops and meetings on this. And uh, if you just email me, I will uh, make sure that you're on a mailing list for that effort. And that, with that, I think I'm done and ready to hand this over. Oh, areas of decadal consideration. Ulf will go into more detail on on these, but these are the the in in pretty large terms the areas that we expect to uh, propose for decadal consideration. Uh, cold atom figures, cold matter, uh, research, quantum entanglement, optical clock based experiments, direct detection of dark energy, dusty plasma uh, physics on the moon and on ISS. And then it, we have a, an open area that is, uh, uh, we're not holding a specific splinter session on here, but we will um, in our white paper development have a space for others for other fundamental physics research ideas. And with that, that though wraps it up for me and it's time for Rolf to talk about the, the splinters. Thank you, Brad. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I've got you. Okay, good. Yeah, so I uh, add my uh, welcome to the participants to, to Brad. Uh, my name is Ossie Israels, and I'm the manager of the uh, Fundamental Physics Portfolio of Activities for NASA headquarters, and I'm at uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I will just talk today about the organization of the splinter sessions that we have that follow on to, to this plenary session that we have right now. There are five splinter sessions, as you will see, and they're all set up as separate WebEx sessions. So please look for the splinter session login details that should have been sent to you in an email from Brad Carpenter. If by chance you do not have it, uh, please type your email address and your um, in which splinter you would like to join in in the chat box, and we will have somebody send you the connect details. So this slide shows the uh, five sprint sessions that we have, have kind of collected our kind of the program direction that we see into. So uh, in no particular order, there's one session that largely talks about physics that you can do with uh, optical clocks in space, but also things that, that are touching more into, you know, like quantum tesla equivalence and equivalence principle and use of atom interferometers in space. So it's really largely, um, you know, high precision instrument, high precision physics that you can do in orbit. There's one session on uh, direct detection of dark energy, which I think doesn't need any. Uh, that's pretty clear what that is. It's about, you know, not not inferring dark energy, but actually searching for candidate particles that could be the dark energy. There's one session on cold atom physics, um, and that's largely, you know, the cold atom lab that NASA has up in orbit right now, and the future directions beyond that and beyond the decal that, that the DLR, the German team, is putting up into space in a few years, and what goes beyond that. There's one session on quantum entanglement, um, and it's, the particular focus is really on, on lunar distances, but uh, in general, quantum optics and quantum entanglement in space. And then there's the, the session shown in the bottom, which is a kind of a combination of, of you know, what physics research do we need to do to better understand dusty plasma uh, on the moon? And uh, what research can we do on complex dusty plasmas on the ISS? So I'm gonna go through these uh, and introduce the chairs for these in, uh, in sequence and um, say a little bit about the session. So the cold atom physics, and this is in no particular order per se, the cold atom physics um, chair is uh, Professor Wolfgang Schleich. Um, he is, um, so that's, uh, yeah, okay. So this is not the, the latest chart I sent, but that, that's okay. I had an update chart that I sent out yesterday that had the NRES coordinator and some tweaks to this, but slightly different order. 
but this is fine. Um, so, uh, Professor Schleich is the professor of theoretical physics and director of the quantum physics department and the recently formed Center for Integrated Quantum Science and Technology at the University of Ulm in Germany. He also does have joint appointments in the Texas A&M Institutes for Quantum Science and Engineering and the Hollier Institute for Advanced Study. Wolfgang Schleich has been engaged in research on quantum optics ranging from the foundations on quantum fixed physics, clear general relativity to number theory. And as a, a, a note, his textbook, quantum, Physic, quantum optics in physics, I'm sorry, quantum optics in phase space was published uh, in the, all the way to Chinese edition in, in 2010 and it's also been translated into Russian. You can see the layout of this session there. Um, there'll be talks about the Cold Atom Laboratory, the status of that, talks about uh, the follow on German experiment called BCAL, and then a perspective on, on future directions. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. So, the direct detection of dark energy. Um, the session is chaired by uh, Dr. Jason Rhodes from JPL. He is an observational cosmologist at JPL and is working towards understanding the mysteries of dark matter and dark energy using space telescopes like the WFIRST and the European Space Agency's Euclid mission. He is the main USPI for Euclid and also the JPL project scientist for WFIRST. Uh, you can see the uh, list of speakers and the kind of the panelists for the session. There will be talks on dark energy, dark matter, and astrophysics perspective. So that's an interesting thing that we're combining together here. So the traditional laboratory physics that we are mostly about, but uh, of course there's a strong link in, in the dark energy world to observational physics. So there's a very strong connection to the astrophysics community there. And so it's a good match. Um, Anyway, uh, there'll be a discussion of a, a, a concept that's under development to, to do a space experiment for that and looking at you know, screening models that are potentially responsible for, for the dark energy signal. Let's go to the next session, please. Quantum entanglement. Um, the chair for this session is Professor Paul Criat from University of Illinois, uh, Champaign, uh, Urbana-Champaign. Paul is the Bardeen Professor of Physics there, and he is one of the world leaders in studies of quantum optics and quantum information systems. In 2018, he was instrumental in forming the Illinois Quantum Information Science and Technology Center, which he now directs. Uh, there's two speakers, Paul himself and Thomas Jenneline, and, and they'll talk about aspects of quantum optics. Uh, there's a science definition team that has been ongoing in this area to look at you know, what can be done in terms of quantum entanglement physics from lunar distances, and that will be shared, the status of that activity will be shared and, and, and rolled out to the participants. Uh, next, please. Okay, the next is um, optical clock and equivalence principle. Um, the chair for this session is Professor Kurt Gibble from Penn State University. Um, he's a professor of physics there, and his research addresses a range of topics on microwave, optical, and space-based atomic clocks and the scattering of ultra-cold atoms. Kurt is a key con contributor to the ACES mission that is set to launch uh, later this year, actually in about a year's time, in August 21, and he has been engaged in with a long-term effort to develop clocks in space. He is a fellow of the American Physical Society. Uh, you can see the list of, of panelists and talks for this session. Uh, we have had a science definition team uh, led by Chris Oates over the last uh, year in this area. So they will share details of that study about, uh, you know, what to do with optical clocks in space. And they'll also be talking about quantum tesla equivalence principle in space and, and perspective from other presenters. Next, please. Uh, the last session is the complex dusty plasma lunar dust research. We have a co-chair in this session, <clears throat> um, and they're chaired by uh, Professor Ed Thomas from the University of Auburn and Professor Trell Hyde of Baylor University. Um, 
I should say, uh, Ed is the Charles Barkley Endowed Professor and also Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Studies at, at Auburn. And Terrell is the Professor of Physics at Baylor University. Um, Terrell is also the Founder and Director of the Center for Astrophysics, Space Physics, and Engineering Research at Baylor. Both of the co-chairs are active researchers participating in PK4 and other experimental plasma physics activities. And I think Brad mentioned that this uh, both have leadership positions in the recently completed Plasma Science Decadal Survey, which we hope will, will uh, you know, benefit us strongly in, in as we roll out uh, our decadal in, uh, white paper effort. You can see the speakers and panelists at the bottom there. We have had a science definition team led by Christine Hartzell uh, looking at, you know, what physics uh, is required for lunar dust research and mitigation. There will also be talks about PK4 and the follow on to PK4, which is an ESA DLR mission. Uh, the follow on is called Compact. And uh, John Gore is also on this, this panel. So I think that's covering them. Is there another slide? Next, please. Yeah, so we just have a QA. Uh, I had put some pointers on there. Let me pull up my chart so I can see what I said. Yeah, so I noticed that there's a there's a, both a Q&A and a chat box now. So uh, please put any questions that you have. We are now into the Q&A session. Put them in the, the chat box and we will do our best to, to try to address those. Um, the questions for this session should be really limited to general decadal survey type questions. We don't want to have, you know, to get into the re detailed research areas in the, in the five splinter panels that are coming up. We will leave those discussions to those panels. So things about the, you know, general things about the decadal survey process, white paper generalities, and, and, and so on. So with that, I should stop here and invite questions. And I can start by, you know, people that registered um, while people get to get their questions in here. Um, people that registered have already sort of asked some questions and I can refer to a few things that I've picked up from there. There were some questions about, you know, members of industry, you know, is there a place for them to, to link in and and participate in something like a decadal survey? And the answer is yes, it's perfectly okay for them to submit white papers on perspective of you know, what they can do for to develop technology or to participate and so on. Um, so we have oh, a question here. Yeah. I, we, I've forgotten to mention that um, we expect to have the presentations from this town hall on the ASGSR website, and we'll follow up with the attendees on on uh, exactly how they can get a hold of those our presentations. Good. And yes. just uh, as a legal notice, we are recording this meeting, so if you if, if you um, are worried about that, uh, well, you figure out how to handle it. Yeah, that's good to mention, correct. Uh, we have a question from Dan Center Kern about where can we find previous relevant decadal survey information so as to understand the overlap with this next one. We can post the previous one. Um, there is, um, so there's really one-to-one -one overlap with what we are doing here. Some of the other parts of that decadal are not uh, perhaps as focused uh, so, the, but I think there's a one to one. We can we can post that and just look for well, it's, look for it's that a, either on the ASGSR. Yeah, well, we can so, post a link to the the uh, the uh, 2011 decadal, but it, it is available on the Space Studies Board's website. So, if you go to the National Academy Space Studies Board, they have a list of all of their publications, their their other uh, decadals, and I think you go down to like. 2011 or 2012 in order to find our a previous decadal. 
So Brad and Alf, it seems as a panelist, I can only answer questions and not ask them. So I thought I'd um, ask one question here, which is, can you comment for these white papers, are there elements or ingredients that are especially important to feeding information into the decadal report? So do you have a sense of what might make them more or less impactful? Well, yeah, the, uh, the key that I've seen written up in other guides to, to writing effective white papers is, is just having a, 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 a nice concise description of, of the, the, uh, your research objectives and, and the impact of that, essentially like writing a good proposal, you know, although it's written at a lot higher level, you're not, you're not talking um, about a specific of a specific research project and with you know me methods and materials and that sort of thing but actually when you get to uh, mission concepts that are reviewed um, for other decadals they actually do put them through a technical management and cost evaluation so when you get up to the level of a mission concept you do have to have a substantial amount of of technical content in your your submission but that's not what we're talking about here this that's is not what we're talking about 30,000 foot view 30, 30 yeah or maybe 15,000 feet but it, it it it's not it's not at the level of a, a specific proposal but it, it has to be something that will convince uh, people like yourself that this is this is going to be a really important um, or it's, it's a very worthwhile thing to do and it's actually got to be a little bit broader than that because you have to convince people who are you know, people working in in uh, other fields that might be on the decadal that it that it's a good idea and a good thing to do so so you do have to have a, a sense of the breadth of your audience there that the rest of the decadal committee Yeah, I, I think it's uh, to follow up on that. I think it's important to 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 uh, for the community to, to respond in a broad way. I think that's you know we we want to have in, you know it, I think it's effective to get input to talk about sort of the experimental work that can be done, talk about the theoretical work that is required, and talk about uh, you know technology development that, that is required to, to implement certain things. So all of those areas are quite important to get in there. Uh, we have a question about uh, presentations. Uh, will they be posted online? Uh, we will uh, certainly, uh, the ones you saw here from Brad and, and myself will be posted online and we we'll probably do it at the ASDSR site. We will talk to the uh, presenters of the other ones and as long as they get permission, we're gonna post those online also. We have a question here. Um, Common briefly on potential platforms for future missions, IA, ISS versus pre flying spacecraft, et cetera. Do you want to comment on that, Brian? I think that since this is spanning a decade, we do have to consider. Um, the use of platforms beyond the ISS. And since our science is growing as well, we should be thinking about the platforms that are that are required by the science we want to achieve. And a lot of our research ideas are going to require platforms beyond the ISS. So yeah, I think well, ISS is is an been attractive uh, research facility for us, we should be completely open-minded about uh, other platforms, including the, the gateway, the lunar surface, and, and free-flying satellites. Okay, we have a question about um, 
which agencies are the primary audience for this survey? Is it mostly NASA or is it also distributed to other potential partner agencies like NSF, NIST, and DOE? We're the only uh, sponsor of, of this, this decadal. So other agencies are not expecting to get any recommendations from uh, this decadal. They may they may take um, they may take some initiative from the decadal, but they're certainly not uh, at this point buying into the decadal. Unlike, say, astrophysics, where at NSF's um, astrophysics program is a co-sponsor of the decadal, and they they look for recommendations on new ground-based facilities from the astrophysics decadal. So we have a specific question about sort of focusing down on the white paper. Uh, so, so the question is, so the goal of the white paper is to present a concrete and detailed idea, which will then spark an idea that grows into a mission like Cal did, question mark. Possibly, I mean, it, well, we're looking for for research ideas that you know themes and mission concepts. Uh, the research themes can span uh, a, a whole range of investments, starting with just a, a ground-based program. 